Light his particles scatters all around, revealing size and shape without a sound. Hi guys! Today we are going to cover another light scattering technique called static light scattering. Here is our agenda. First, we are going to recap what is light scattering. Second, we are going to understand what is the definition for static light scattering and what does this technique actually aim to tell us. And then we are going to the very base case or simplest light scattering scenario. We are going to understand how tiny particles scatter light. And then we are going to add another complication to, to look at how particles scatter light if the size has increased. And then on top of that, we're going to add another complication to look at the scenario when there is no ideal solution. In the end, we are going to wrap everything up. We're going to introduce the tin plot. Okay, then let's get started. First, let's recap a little bit how light scattering works. What exactly is light scattering? So imagine you have some particles and then you have some light uh, that is hitting the particles. First, we know light can be understood as electromagnetic wave, right? It has a magnetic field component and also an electric field component towards it. When light hits particles, there are electrons in the particles and therefore in the presence of the electric field, the electrons in the particles will move. This moving of the electrons will actually cause the separation of charges and this is called the induced dipole moment. The E field in the light is actually constantly oscillating. So this means the strength and also the direction of the E field is constantly changing. And this oscillation in the E field will also cause an oscillation in the dipole moment. And when you have an oscillating dipole moment, the particle actually would radiate electromagnetic wave. And this is actually the scattered light. There are two main types of light scattering techniques. One is called dynamic light scattering. Another one is called static light scattering. So we have covered dynamic light scattering in another video. And if you are interested in this technique, please check out the other video I have. The focus or the star of today's show is static light scattering. So it is static because as opposed to dynamic light scattering, static light scattering technique is interested in the time average intensity of the scattered light. And instead of analyzing the fluctuations, we actually measure the total scattered light at different angles and often at various sample concentrations. And from this technique, we are going to derive so many useful information. One thing is the molecular weight, another thing is the size of the molecule, and uh, the next is the interactions between the solute molecules in the solution. In the simplest case, we are assuming that the light is hitting a very tiny particle. You can put it roughly at a size uh, that is below 1 20th of the laser wavelength. In this case, you see the particle is really negligible compared to laser wavelength. It can really be treated as a point in the space. And when particles as such scatter light, this kind of scattering is called relay scattering. And here we are going to cover a few features about relay scattering. One thing is the intensity of relay scattering is actually proportional to concentration and molecular weight. The second feature of relay scattering is the isotropic nature of the scattered light. When you are shining the particle, with vertically polarized laser light. When I say the scattering is isotropic, it means the scattering is uniform across all of the angles in the measurement plane. Just to make it a bit more comprehensive, I want to mention that when you shine the, the particles with unpolarized light, there is actually some slight angle dependence. The light in the, the vertical angle to the direction of the incident light will actually have a slightly smaller intensity than the light in forward and backward direction. But because normally in the SLS technique, we don't use unpolarized light. That's why I think the most important thing to emphasize here or to remember here is generally relay scattering is isotropic in the standard SLS instrument, which utilized vertically polarized laser light. Now we understand the basics of 
relay scattering. Let's dig in a bit more about how we can measure molecular weight using this phenomenon. You need to use uh, an equation called the relay equation. And on the left of this equation, there is relay ratio. The relay ratio is basically a standardized measure of the scattered light intensity. And on the right, there are several things to explore here. One thing is the concentration. This is what we mentioned before, and also weight average molecular weight. And here the K is actually called the optical constant. As you can see, the K can be expressed in this way. So lambda to the power of four, lambda is the wavelength of the incident laser light, and Na is the Avogadro's number. N0 is the refractive index of the solvent, and DNDC, this is called refractive index increment, is actually a measure of how the refractive index itself changes with the concentration of our specific sample in this specific solvent. And normally you need to measure this DNDC with a specific instrument. Now we have covered the base case of tiny particles scattering light. Let's add a little bit more complication here because, you know, particles cannot always stay tiny. When the particle is large enough, different parts of the same molecule can scatter the incident light. Imagine the light waves scattering from these different points within the molecule. Actually, the scattered waves, they can interfere with each other. So sometimes they cancel each other out and sometimes they add up each other. And the interesting thing to note is that at very low scattering angle, the path difference between the light scattered from point A and point B, that is represented by the distance AC and BC, they are actually quite similar. And as a result of this, the rays emitted by these two positions in the forward direction in the smaller angle are actually more likely to constructively interfere with each other. On the contrary, at higher scattering angle, the, the path lengths AD and BD, they have greater difference. While some of the specific path difference could lead to constructive interference, many others actually lead to destructive or partial cancellation. If you average over all of these points in the molecule, the overall effect you observe is that the cancellation becomes more significant than addition. And therefore, what you observe is that the scattered intensity actually drops off as the measurement angle increase. Mathematically, you could account for this angular dependence using a function called the form factor. So you can revise your relay equation to take into account this form factor. P theta is one when the angle is zero. When angle is larger than zero, P theta is smaller than one. For a very small particle, P theta is actually roughly equals to one. So we account for the relay scattering also within this equation. Now imagine that you want to analyze MW using uh, the relay equation. The simplest thing to do, right, is to measure the scattered light intensity at an angle that equals to zero, because when it equals to zero, P theta is one. But it's practically not feasible to measure the scattered light intensity at theta equals to zero, because in that forward direction, the detector is actually overwhelmed by intensity of the incident laser light. Because of this difficulty to measure directly at theta equals to zero degree, we have to extrapolate. It turns out the form factor can be approximated by the Guignard approximation as such. So one over the form factor is roughly equal to one plus Q square RG square over three. And RG is the radius of gyration. Q is called the scattering vector. So Q equals to four pi N over lambda times sine theta over two. So here you see the angle part uh, being taken into account. Back to the relay equation, R theta equals to KC and W P theta. You know, we can rearrange the equation to put P theta on the left and moving R theta to the right. And then the, the equation would become Kc over r theta equals to 1 over mw p theta. 
And here we can plug in the Guinier approximation, uh, which becomes this. We can further expand it. Eventually it looks like this. And this is really looking like the form of a straight line. And this is where the so-called Guinier plot comes in. So in the Guinier plot, you have Kc over r theta as the y-axis, and you have sine square theta over 2 on the x-axis. So you would make a plot based on the measurements you made, and then you could extrapolate this line back to the y-intercept, and this y-intercept would be 1 over mw. And the slope towards smaller angle is uh, related to the radius of gyration, and and therefore you can solve for a radius of gyration by analyzing the slope. Okay, great, we have covered already a lot here. Now we are ready to accept another challenge. This is when the solution is no longer considered ideal. So what is an ideal solution? Well, an ideal solution is a solution where the solute molecules don't really interact with each other. However, when you have increasing concentration of the solutes in the molecules, the molecules, the solute molecules, they actually attract each other or they repel each other. And these interactions between the solute molecule will actually change how the light is scattered. And to cover this, we actually introduce the second virial coefficient into the equation. So for non-ideal solution, Kc over r theta would roughly equals to 1 over mw times the form factor plus 2 second virial coefficient times the concentration. This equation is called the relay debye tin equation. To be on the comprehensive side, I wanted to mention that actually the relay debye tin equation should actually include some higher order terms like A3, A4, A5. So each of them would represent interactions among three particles or among four particles. But for practical purpose, the relay debye tin equation is normally expressed in the truncated form. If we can make a simplification by setting P theta roughly equals to 1, then this equation becomes much more manageable in this form. This approximation can be made in the scenario when we have relay scatterer, meaning very small particles, or when you are making measurements at very, very low angle. So after making this simplification, we get the so-called Debye equation. If you take Kc over r theta as the y-axis, the concentration as x-axis, by extrapolating back to zero concentration, you actually get the intercept and the slope would just be 2 times a2. You see, each of this approach actually gives us valuable information, but each of this approach also gives us incomplete information. Is there actually a single plot that would allow us to derive all three simultaneously? Well, there is, and this is called the Tim plot. So the Tim plot basically combines all our previous methods into one comprehensive analysis. And what is really smart about the Tim plot is in how we plot this data. So instead of plotting Kc over r theta against just the angular term or plotting it just against the concentration term, they actually plot the Kc over r theta against a combined term that takes into account both the angular component as well as the concentration component. And this creates actually a very distinctive grid-like pattern. Each of these points actually represents a measurement. This measurement you made at a specific angle, theta, and at a specific concentration. When you connect all of these points together, you get lines of constant angle and you get lines of constant concentration. Now, in the Tim plot, we perform a so-called double extrapolation. This means we would extrapolate these points to two different ideal conditions. One ideal condition is the condition where theta equals to zero. And then the second ideal condition we extrapolate is the line of zero concentration. And this extrapolated zero concentration and zero angle line 
are very, very useful because when you connect them, they would converge on a single point in the y axis. And this represents 1 over mw. And on top of that, you can actually make use of the slope to derive RG and A2. So the zero angle line has varying concentration. And therefore, with the changing concentration, we could actually get information about uh, the virial coefficient. Whereas the zero concentration line actually has information of scattered light from various angles. And therefore, from this slope, we can actually get information about the radius of gyration. Okay, so thank you so much for sticking with me up to this point, because we are done. Let's take a moment to summarize what we learned in this video. We learned about the definition of static light scattering. We know SLS is a technique that measures time average intensity of the scattered light, and this information helps us to determine MW, RG, and A2. Next up, we learned about the simplest case of light scattering. This is called relay scattering, and this is scattering for really, really small particle compared to the wavelength of the instant light. It has a very important feature of isotropic scattering when they are shined by vertically polarized laser light. The standardized uh, light intensity R theta is proportional to the concentration as well as the molecular weight. And then after that, we introduced a slightly more complicated case of scattering for larger particles. For these particles, we noted that the intensity of the scattered light is actually depending on the angle of the measurement. To account for this angle dependency, we introduced a form factor into the relay equation. We can actually introduce a Guinier approximation to the p theta, and this helps us to determine Rg and Mw via the Guinier plot. After this, we introduce a more complicated scenario of non-ideal solution. In non-ideal solution, we introduce this concentration to the relay equation to finally arrive at our relay divides him equation. And we know that uh, if we can make simplifying assumption about p theta, approximating p theta equals to 1, we can actually get a very useful relationship that helps us to determine A2 and MW via the Debye plot. And finally, we looked at the sim plot, and this is a powerful plot that allows us to look at both uh, angular dependency data as well as concentration dependency data. And this helps us to determine all of these parameters simultaneously. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed watching this video, and I really hope that this is easy to follow and it's helpful for you. Thank you so much, and I will see you in the next video.